Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes here to kind of introduce the course to you, and then I'm going to take a few minutes to go through the summer packet uh, with some corrections and also some guidance, so there's nothing to fear there. You are all very capable of finishing that packet with your current skill set. So the class is statistics, and so what is statistics really? Well, in actuality, when you're studying statistics, it's the study of variability. So think about anything that can vary, which is pretty much anything, hair color, eye color, your heights, uh, your likes as well, different things like that, and we can measure them, and that's, so that's basically what statistics comes down to. And so in this class, it's going to break down into two different courses, really, in a way, and they connect, but we're going to start with descriptive statistics, and then the second half of the class, we're going to talk about inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics, we're going to collect the data, we're going to make histograms, we're going to make box plots, we're going to make scatter scatter plots and, and diagrams like that. And then we're just going to talk about what we see. Is one getting bigger? Where are the numbers? But we're not really passing judgment. We're just describing what's there. When we get to inferential statistics, we'll try to make conclusions. For example, if we're trying to prove that there's pollution, we'll say, well, based on the data we collected, is it meaningfully different from what it's supposed to be? And then if we're able to prove that, then obviously there's an issue. And so that'll be the whole second half of the class. If you're taking AP Psych, this class will overlap m in many ways with that class, so make sure that you pay attention to to especially the data analysis because you're going to see it in AP Psych as well. So we're going to take variables, which is anything that can vary. So think about all the different questions I asked on that survey to you. Those are all variables because they can come out with different answers. And the data we, the answers we get, we collect as data. And there's two different categories that these could split into. So categorical data would be basically counting, putting things into categories. And there's a couple ways we could do that. We could rank them. We could say if we're counting the number of sodas, small, medium, and large, since there's a natural progression, we call that an ordinal categorical variable. And also think about like freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, because you get older through the progression that has an order to it. But then we have non-ordinal categorical variables, and those would include gender and race and political affili affiliation, because there's no actual uh, preference in order, so like blue is not better than red or anything like that. You'll also hear the word qualitative. You'll definitely hear that in uh, AP Psych. Under quantitative variables, these are things you're going to measure. So you can measure height, you can measure how many students, and depending on uh, what you're, how you're measuring it, it's either going to be a continuous or discrete variable. So discrete would be kind of like counting. So if I was counting how many students there are in the school, whereas continuous would be like time where you actually have this whole uh, progression through all the numbers or how tall you can be. You can take on any number that you want with those numbers. And of course, it's a little bit semantical because when we measure height, we measure it to say like the tenth of an inch, but we'd still consider that kind of continuous even though we're obviously cutting it off. And so what we're going to have to do is, well, what do we want data of? That's what we're going to have to figure out. So what we're going to do is saying, who do we want to get the data for? Now, population. When I think of population, I think of the population of, of the whole country. But maybe we're just trying to figure out information about juniors, and then juniors would become our population. So population can be a little bit of a confusing word, because you've only heard it as, like, say, the population of the country, and you think about it that way. But it's basically, what group do you want to study? And so the information in there, and you have to believe in absolutes in statistics. Say the population has a definitive answer to it. For example, like you could be able to find the definitive average height of the population. And so those those uh inf that information we get out are going to be called parameters. And these are the kind of symbols you're going to see. So this would be for a mean, we would use this symbol. This is mu. You may remember that as the coefficient of friction, but we use that for the mean. This would be the standard deviation of the population, and this would be the proportion or the percentage of the population. But what we're going to do is we want to really figure out the population. So when you when you ask everyone in the population, you get all that information. That's called taking a census. But census isn't really that practical. So what we're going to end up doing is try to take samples of the population. And when you take a sample, you get what's called a statistic, not statistics, which would be a mean, a standard deviation, a proportion. And this is the symbols we would use for that. And basically, what we're going to do is try, especially when we get to inferential statistics, is use the sample to try to figure out what's going on in the population. And that, in general, is what statistics is all about and why we use it so much and why it's used in so many fields. 
So let's switch over to the summer packet now and get started. So we're talking about measures of central tendency. That's the middle. We're trying to figure out about what's going on in the middle of our data. And of course, you know some of this already. You know about the mean, the median, and the mode. And usually we have arguments about which is better, the mean or the median, depending on the data. In science, you often use the median, and the question is, why would you do that? But before we start, let's think about the mean and the median. If I just have two numbers, say we take 15 and 11 here, the mean and the median actually are the exact same number. So the only time they can actually start to differ is when you have more than two numbers. Okay, So remember that the mean is actually the, the average. You can down here, that, that's our arithmetic mean if you see it on the SAT. And of course the median is the middle. So we line them up in order and then we find the middle number or we might have to take the mean of the two middle numbers. So these are, sometimes I feel like the mean and the median people argue about which one's better. They both tell you something about the data. So basically you should remember that when would I use one over the other really is that people generally use the median when the data is skewed a certain way. So if there's big numbers, so like say I added the number like 1,000 here, that would really mess up this data in terms of the mean and the median would give me a better idea of the data. So when there's uh, outliers, you would use the median instead of the mean. But they both tell you something about the data. And of course the mode is the, is the most common number. Uh, in the data set. So let's move down here a little bit, looking at box plot here, box and whisker plot, we just call it a box plot. Um, remember that when you line up the data, you're going to take the, the low mark, and we're also going to talk about how to get outliers down here. We'll talk about that coming up and up here. But this is the bottom number, the top number, subtract those, that's the range. This is the first quartile. The second quartile, which is the median, and the third quartile here. Now when you actually make these, you shouldn't actually put this uh, line in the middle here um, w when you make them. But you should remember how to make a box plot. It's not really that difficult. Honestly, in the early going, you're going to have to do it by hand, but we're going to use technology quite a bit to make these for us, so it's really about interpret interpreting them, but you got to know where the information comes from so you know what you're looking at. The most important thing about a box plot to remember is that it's this, this line right here, this top quartile, is longer it doesn't mean there's more data in here it means the data is more spread out in each one of these quartiles there's the same amount of data so you can see how spread out the data is based on how wide each interval it is but it doesn't mean there's more data in it it just is telling you about the variability of the data and so this should all be very straightforward again when you make the box and whisker plots don't put in the middle lines there the one thing that this is really missing here is we should have a scale on the bottom and on the AP test you're gonna have to have that so you should make some sort of scale, so this would be zero, and then my scale is not going to be very good here, but when, when you do it, you should have a scale. So when you make it down here, have a scale, so this way you can have something to, to look off of. It's also helpful to put the numbers here, so you can better see what's going on, but you don't have to do that, but you have to have a scale. That's a big one. You'll lose points on a lot of labs and such if you don't have a scale because you need it on the AP exam. So next, let's talk about how we're going to visually organize the data. So we're going to look at some categorical data first. Two ways we display that is with a line plot and down here with a bar graph. So this data here is about number of new cars sold each week by each salesperson. And this data here, we could actually kind of go either way on. They're using it here, and this is fine as categorical data because they're setting up each category. And so... If we scroll down to the to the bar graph, you can see how there's spaces here because they're treating it as categorical uh, data because these are the categories. But because these numbers mean something, we could actually uh, use this as quantitative data. And the only difference would be we wouldn't be using a line plot. We'd be using something called a dot plot. And we'd have the frequency over here. And basically, these would be dots instead of these Xs. But in the end, they're really the same. It doesn't matter if you use a... Uh, X or a dot there. And this would actually be a histogram. These bars would actually be touching each other. The difference between a, a, a dot plot and a histogram, and you'll see this later, is that histograms usually group these together and make one bar for multiple numbers, whereas on a dot plot, you'll actually show each individual category, even if it's only, maybe you'll have many categories with only one hit in it. That's actually why if you had a dot plot like that, you would want to group them so you can better see what's going on. And just to jump ahead a little bit, because this has the shape like this, we would call this, and you notice the tail right here, this is called a skewed right distribution, and that actually means that the median would be here and the mean would be here, so basically the mean would be skewed when you're skewed right. 
And let's move down now. You can see down here, this is much better. You can see how this is much clearer, more categorical, why you would use these kinds of, dis of displays up here. And here we go. So a stem and leaf plot. Remember on a stem and leaf plot that there should only be one stem. So you can see for uh, 25 right here, 32, 35. Um, make sure you don't have more than one stem. Notice I'm not using commas over here. And so you're probably wondering, well, what do we use stem and leaf plots for anyway? And I'll explain to that in one second as we get down to histograms. So histograms, what you're doing is you're is you're grouping all the data together. So here I'm putting all the, this is basically, there's two ways to do this on a histogram. These are the middle of each category. The other way you could do it is I could go and put 30 here and 20 here. And so this category here, technically, either way you do it is from 20 up to 29. Then this is 30 to 39. So it just depends which way you want to do it. You can either put the average number in the middle or you can put the endpoints. But remember, this always rounds up to the next bar. So 30, if I put 30 here, is included in this bar. And this is the frequency that they occur here. Notice how the bars touch here. So let's go back to a stem and leaf plot. If you take a stem and leaf plot and turn it on its side, so just turn your paper. You'll see it's basically a histogram. So it's a it's an easy way to make a, a quick histogram. So that's why we, we like stem and leaf plots. So that's what you're going to do here. <clears throat> now your calculator, you should have probably an 83 or an 84. Those are fine. Those are the two we're going to go through in this class. <clears throat> and you should get to learn how to use. Go under stat, play around, learn these keystrokes, go in there, do it. It's, it's pretty straightforward from there. <clears throat> you should also look up one variable stats. Um, in in the stat menu because that'll do all of these kind of for you as well. You need to know how to use your calculator. We're going to depend a lot on it, and because it's a lot about interpretation of what's on your calculator, which should make you feel good. It's not just going to be about this this rote creating all these histograms and 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 box plots and bar graphs. You don't need to worry about that. It's about interpretation, but you will have to make a few and know how to use the technology to help you. So we're going to be surveying people. That's fun. I already made a survey. You guys me making survey. That's kind of fun to collect data and organize it and see what happens. So you're going to create a couple questions here. Think about how the responses would be. You can think about what that means in terms of the of the variables that you're going to get back. This is a fun one. It's just understanding data. You're going to set a median, try to and get the range and the mean, and you can't use number more than three times. So think about how you would start doing that. You might start with the median. You might start with the range. I would say the mean is kind of the most difficult part of this, but start with these two and then work towards that, and then talk about how you did it. You know, there's no one should have the same two answers to this question because there's many, many ways to do it. All right, moving on. This is pretty straightforward. This is actually from an AP test. So think about how you would answer these questions. Just looking for relationships. I'm sure you'll do fine with this. And that's kind of it. So uh, make sure you fill out your survey, that you sign up for mind.com, and that you finish this, and you're going to be in great shape. There's really nothing to this. You're all capable of, of doing well in this class. You just got to put in the work. And uh, I'll see you very shortly.